All righty. Well, let's get started. Um, thank you very much for coming. I wanted to just start by introducing our panel, uh, talking today about COVID-19 and health and human rights. Um, we've got great folks here that um, bring a wealth of experience and different perspectives from around the globe. Um, one of the people here is Felicita uh, Heikuma, who is the director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance of Southern Africa, which is a partnership of 115 NGOs in 18 countries in Southern and East Africa that works to promote human rights approaches to HIV and tuberculosis. Uh, Felicita is an old friend and has been at Arasa since 2008 and was appointed the director of the organization last year. Um, she's worked at the national, regional, and international levels on sexual reproductive health and rights, on human rights and health, and in development policy and advocacy. Uh, we also have uh, Ed Nagoskin, who is a technical advisor on community responses and key populations at the Global Fund, where he oversees the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation and review of programs specifically targeted to reach people at, at high risk of, of HIV. Um, including sex workers, people who use drugs, men who have sex with men, and other populations. Prior to the Global Fund, Ed worked with the Global Network of People Living with HIV, uh, based out of South Africa, and the International Treatment Preparedness Co Coalition. And finally, we have uh, J.P. Mogahat Heath, who is an Anglican priest, the former acting executive director of the South Africa-based International Network of Religious Leaders Living With or Personally Affected by HIV and AIDS and currently working with the Church of Sweden as a policy advisor on HIV and theology. So welcome everybody, I'm glad you could come. I wanted to just start the, the kind of questions off with you, Felicita, and just ask you to talk a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground in terms of HIV and human rights concerns and sort of where you see the biggest challenges and maybe some successes. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, just to get started, I guess, I mean, from my vantage point, what I'm seeing and what we're experiencing as an organization, um, and maybe to start, go back to, say, you know, the beginning of last year, um, the first cases of, of COVID were reported um, in March um, last year in this part of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then we went into hard lockdown towards the end of the year, and uh, sorry, the end of that month, so the end of Mar March. Um, and what we initially witnessed was a lot of social stigma. Um, so there was, um, for example, a case here in Namibia where the first, um, the first, the first two cases of um, of COVID were tourists who came into Namibia, um, and they seemingly were exposed to some of the people who were working in the hotel that they visited. And one of the women who um, was working in this hotel, when they then um, realized that they'd been exposed, all of the workers were quarantined. And there were news reports about the family being called the COVID family or the Corona family um, and being ostracized and um, really harassed and taunted in their communities. Um, but that is also just an example of what we experienced across the region in terms of you know, the stigma that came with the fear. And um, because at the time we also were watching all these um, cases of, of death and um, kind of devastation in Europe um, and in Italy in particular. And so everybody was really quite afraid, not really sure about what this disease was. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, confusion and a lot of fear, which really did fuel um, the social stigma. But in terms of, um, you know, from an organization's kind of point of view, one of the things that we realized um, over the last couple of months has been that the ability of organizations who do human rights work um, and also who support health responses, in particular HIV responses, um, there was kind of a mixed bag in terms of how they were able to adapt um, and continue to deliver on their mandate. And one of the things that was really interesting was how few governments were able to actually engage them right from the beginning and also how few governments in their responses engaged communities that were um, most at risk or most affected. Um, and so the, the response was very kind of medicalized and very centralized. Um, and, you know, for example, in Namibia, we had a COVID-19 response center 
and they, they, were, they were only kind of, you know, representatives of different ministries who were sitting on this COVID response, you know, task force or whatever, and they would be the ones who would give information on a daily basis. Um, but there was no kind of perspectives from how communities were responding, how communities were affected, what communities needed. So the response was really very kind of top-down, centralized, uh, biomedical, and, and very little consideration for kind of the human rights um, aspects of, of the response. Let me stop there, um, Joe, there's a lot more that I can share about that, but um, that's basically what, what we've been experiencing over the last couple of months. Yeah, I think we can have this um, webinar go on for hours probably with all of the different aspects of it. I mean, one of the points that you make, Felicity, which I have seen in, in the US as well as in many other places, you know, is this idea of where knowledge sits about who's most yeah. vulnerable, right? And so yeah. it's there are certain populations that are very visible. And in the US, it was clear like, oh, we need to be concerned about people on cruise ships. We need mm -hmm. to be concerned about college students and dormitories and military and barracks. Um, but really actually looking at the populations uh, at the most risk, mm -hmm. those populations aren't represented. They're not visible. They're not at the top of the list of the populations that people are thinking about and understand what measures are going to be effective for them. And this seems like a good uh, opportunity to jump to Ed, since you work on these populations and you think about these populations in the context of HIV, TB, and malaria. But when COVID came along, you know, there's obvious sort of similarities, but also probably some differences in terms of vulnerability. So can you speak to the work that you've done over the past year? Yeah, sure, Joe. Thank you so much. And just to highlight, you know, the um, the impact of the COVID really uh, have on these um, communities, so-called key populations, right? These are understood that those who, even prior to the COVID pandemics, are already significantly at increased risk of contracting the uh, diseases. For example, 62% of new HIV infections really are happening among this group. And those, and these are the same people who have really suboptimal uh, access to services and face severe stigma and discriminations. Uh, in the context of HIV, we often talk about gay men and other men who have sex with men, uh, transgender sex workers, people who inject drugs, and people in prison and other close settings. And in TB, we're talking about and malaria, we often talk about refugees, internally displaced people, undocumented migrants, and, and other groups. So the COVID um, 19 really exacerbate vulnerabilities of these key population and we see in all the programs that we support and uh, this, there are several factors that really elevate their risk uh, for HIV also place them at risk for acquiring COVID-19 and we're talking about issue around high mobility the close physical contact with others through uh, social and sex uh, sexual practices and most, most importantly, I think the issue around the lack of livelihood as a consequence of COVID-19 restriction on movement, for example, for communities like sex workers, the poverty, uh, lack of access to shelters, lack of protection by the government also means that their livelihood and well-being are significantly impacted. And given the legality of the work that they do and practices that, that, that they have uh, sexually um, they are often targeted by law enforcement under public health and uh, order laws. So early in the lockdowns uh, last year, we see multiple reports of uh, key populations being targeted, harassed and arrested. And, and this, um, this couple with the challenges that we face, which is around the continuity of health services and services disruption, that means that many of the populations who require routine care will not be able to access health facilities or receive a life-saving prevention testing, treatment care and services they need. So obviously the COVID really impact them directly. Um, and we have been working since the COVID pandemic to really help organizations to better adapt to these challenges. And as Felicita uh, mentioned, it, it's been an uphill struggle um, the, some of the uh, civil society organizations are much better at adapting um, their services to meet the needs of the community. Others are uh, quite slow in adapting it. At the same time, the government services are much, much uh, further behind. You know, there's a 
um, a movement of human resources to the COVID ward, which leave a lot of um, gaps in the HIV and TB malaria services. So I think that's quite um, that's quite a major challenge for us as a funding institution to ensure that uh, both community services and health services continue to operate in the way that uh, that uh, link with each other, uh, so that the communities are not are not being left behind. Great, I think that's a. It's really interesting to sort of see the discussion move a little bit beyond just the ad hoc initial policy making to recognizing these sort of structural barriers of laws and policing on these populations and the ways in which you know that's creating vulnerability and risk. It's not just that the risk is inherent in these populations, but it's a consequence of this. I want to turn to you, JP, a little bit and also got, kind of get your perspective on what the biggest challenges have been here and sort of where there may have been some successes so far. Thanks, Joe. I think that um, for me, much of the, the, the challenge that I see around uh, COVID-19 has been the dramatic inequality that we have observed around the world in, uh, in terms of the way in which these things have operated. Um, the, the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden a number of years ago initiated a program that was to do uh, specifically with migrants and, and she called the program a world of neighbors, um, trying to emphasize the fact that we all have to coexist, we have to live together, we have to find a way of supporting each other, we have to be the support for each other. Um, and, and when COVID came, um, a country like Sweden that has always said the the zero comma seven percent that we have to or that uh, that uh, developed countries choose to give uh, into development fund isn't enough. Sweden is going to give one percent, and uh, you know these sort of uh, proactive statements of we have to do more for development, for support, for for being the network for each other, and then COVID comes. And it's this mad rush of look after yourself first. And, and as we sit at the moment, the US, the UK and the EU has overbought 1,3 billion doses of the virus, uh, of, of the vaccine. So that, uh, less, less resource secure parts of the world, um, just have no access. And, and uh, the, 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 the blatant inequality, I, I like to call it medical apartheid or vaccine apartheid uh, that we have seen in regard to COVID-19 emphasizes for us again exactly what we have seen uh, in terms of medication and testing uh, around HIV. Uh, around HIV, uh, you know, in, 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 in uh, 2000, when I tested HIV positive in South Africa, people in Europe and North America had been uh, having access to triple therapy for almost a decade. It wasn't available in Africa at all. It wasn't uh, until a number of years later with the treatment action campaign that, that we even got the introduction of, of therapy. And, and we are seeing exactly the same responses from around the world in regard to, to COVID-19. Um, early on in the pandemic, when, when, um, when there was this push for the masks uh, that, that were necessary for PPE, companies that were selling it had their stock claimed by their governments. They weren't allowed to export it to other parts of the world. And, and uh, the first case that I heard of like that was in relation to the US. And then we could all say, oh, the bad boys, the US. No, just a few uh, weeks after that, a company in Germany was exporting oxygen to, to Brazil. Oxygen claimed at the, at the airport, it wasn't allowed to leave the country because they needed it in Germany. Um, the, the vaccines that were seized in, in the airport in Italy that were being uh, flown out to Australia. No, we need them in Europe. The, uh, when, when South Africa couldn't access the, the, the test kits for COVID-19 early on and said, okay, we make our own test kits. They couldn't even buy the reagents necessary because it had all been gobbled up 
by the greedy North. So, uh, you know, this radical inequality uh, is, is a, a, a massive challenge for us in terms of COVID-19. And, and the truth of it is that unless we find a way of being able to share equitably around the world, none of us are free. We all will be constrained. Uh, you know, part of what we are lamenting is this is the fact that that we need to be cooped up in our environments to to stay safe. Well, there's going to be no way safe to go to if we don't make uh, testing and vaccines and treatment agents available to everybody. Thanks, JP. The hallmark to me from the start of the pandemic was this sense of you know, lockdown of shutting yourself up and and not thinking about your neighbor next door who might be 80 years old and afraid to go get groceries. And sort of from the very beginning, it's all been about the ways in which you distance yourself from people and the ways in which countries distance themselves from other countries by putting in barriers to travel. And I don't think the vaccine has really done anything to change that dynamic there's still a sense of like well i want my vaccine so that i'm protected but there isn't yet any real fundamental discussion of solidarity in that way and sort of how does that message of you know we're not safe until we're all safe kind of get across like how how can we overcome that position that we're in now to try and make that message something that's that's better accepted or understood? Or you know, what's the argument that's going to get people to see this in a different way? From my perspective, it's it's uh, something that, that can be called for in a number of different uh, ways. One is I know that we have an initiative called the People's Vaccine Initiative, where, where there's this drive to try and make sure that vaccines are available for everybody. I also know that uh, there are a number of, of religious leaders and institutions around the world who have called for this equality. I know the COVAX program is something that has been spoken of and, and a country like Sweden has now uh, given uh, quite generously towards COVAX. But part of the problem that we're sitting with here is that um, while COVID-19 is a global pandemic that is, is something that the whole world is having to face, there is massive profiteering that is happening from it. And, and the fact that the vast majority of vaccines as we see them right now have been developed with government funding. Um, and now we are seeing the patents related to those being so closely monitored to make sure that the, the vaccines can't just be produced everywhere so that we can maximize the profits. Now, those two things can't sit side by side. And, and so it, it brings into, into question the whole discussion that we have to have around intellectual property when it comes to global pandemics. It's one that we've wanted to have more seriously around HIV for decades now. And, and uh, I, I, I think that, that there has been a call that we have seen from within the UN system, particularly from the World Health Organization, to try and focus on identifying how we deal more fully with these global pandemics. But, but um, the, the conflict of capital and health is, is a discussion that we haven't really had and one that we are going to have to have uh, more meaningfully around this issue. So Sweden, who has given all this money to COVAX, and, and of course, I am, I'm pleased that they've done that, is still supporting the intellectual property being held by the pharmaceutical companies because we must support capitalism. So, you know, they, they, to me, these don't sit comfortably together. And, and I think that that is an ethical discussion uh, that we have to have. Felicita, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I totally wanted to agree with, uh, with what JP said and just 
as he was ending and talking about, you know, the investment that Sweden has made in COVAX, I just was thinking about the fact that COVAX was set up to be this platform of solidarity that would help, you know, all countries access um, the vaccines equally and equitably. Um, but coming from the country that I'm living in um, and realizing that we've not been able to get uh, vaccines through COVAX because the manufacturing hasn't kept up. So the excess that even COVAX has to vaccines is limited because as JP said, the global north, countries in the global north are hoarding um, these vaccines. And so even though there was this kind of basic principle of, you know, we will set up this mechanism to help us facilitate that, it is still an instrument of inequity. You know, it has become an instrument of inequity because they're investing in it, but they're not making it work because the facility doesn't have access to the vaccines that it needs to get to these um, developing countries. But I also wanted to just reflect on the fact that I think that's one of the lessons that, that we need to take from the HIV response in terms of how people living with HIV were at the forefront of, you know, calling for, uh, you know, people before profits and calling for addressing of the barriers like the, the intellectual property laws that exist um, and they present these barriers um, to increasing kind of access to to, to medicines. And um, what I'm what I'm missing in my in my context, and also to say that very few African activists are, or maybe now recently they've been joining the People's um, Vaccine Campaign. Um, but at the end of last year, beginning of this year, very few of the African human rights activists or even public health kind of activists were involved in that conversation around vaccines inequity. Um, and one of the other things that I was, you know, reflecting on with my colleagues was around how much misinformation is existing around the vaccines in, um, in our communities and how that is limiting people's ability to kind of get angry about the fact that they're not accessing these vaccines. So we're having to fight with misinformation that's telling people, oh, this is, you know, a depopularization uh, campaign by the US, um, you know, they're going to put a chip in you and this and that. Um, and that doesn't make people want to present when these vaccines are available. And that's the case we're facing in my country. So the last thing they're going to want to do is to question why these vaccines are not available. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do to actually get to the point where people living with HIV were angry about the inequities um, in the context of, of COVID. Um, because I think there's, there's, there's a few barriers that we still need to overcome in order to mobilize the communities to the point where they can say enough already. Um, these capitalists can't win. You know, this, this big pharma can't, can't get away with this. You know, that's interesting. And the history of the HIV response, obviously in South Africa, the misinformation and disinformation and, you know, the, the right to accurate information has been key. Um, and I think it's been a huge challenge in many, many places to try and reinforce that. And, you know, sometimes it's been governments that have been to blame and sometimes it's been extra, you know, outside of people outside of governments with conspiracy theories and amplified through social media. But it, it speaks to issues, I think, of the, the failure to establish systems of trust um, mm -hmm. where people can get confident about accurate information where people don't aren't quick to believe conspiracy theories or or you know think twice about what the motivations behind those are um, but I also think that there's this aspect that we're we're all being sort of faced with this challenge of how do we create a network um, that goes beyond one challenge but that sees mm -hmm. the the challenges from climate change, the challenges from HIV, the challenges from mm -hmm. pandemics within this broader context so that we're not just fighting for HIV meds or fighting mm -hmm. for the patent mm -hmm. on one vaccine, mm -hmm. but we're fighting for the, you know, the rules of the game to be changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. Ed, did you want to jump in and? Yeah, I, I fully agree tell with Tell us how to change the rules and since you're based in Geneva. You... I'm not sure I'm the right person to be suggesting how the rules should change, Joe, but uh, I do agree with the, with the colleagues' observations here. And, you know, what COVID really does is really questions the way that, you know, these multilateral agencies are coordinating to support country response, which obviously uh, 
oftentimes you know have outdated system and the processes uh, to get to decision making and covid does really showcase that that you know we have to think differently of how um, we could uh, create a mechanism to support country to roll out the vaccines really quickly um, and it, it took a while for the global communities to come together to agree um, to uh, priorities within the act accelerator on you know the key areas where um, they need to work towards um, strengthening a board health system in country but also making sure that new technologies are able to be procured and distributed uh, and that you know people have access to these technologies um, we I think on a positive note, we, we do receive um, quite a substantive amount of funding just recently from the US government uh, with the new administrations, um, 3.5 billion, I think additional to what they have contributed to the global fund uh, to really support countries to adapt um, their HIV, TB, uh, malaria programs to COVID-19. Uh, and strengthening community, the most important part is community and health systems, as well as addressing um, epidemic preparedness in low and middle income countries. And Germany has followed suit, so they provided some resources to the Global Fund. And at the same time, they're uh, in talk directly with um, uh, governments like Indonesia to really redirect the debt program to, to the public health program that respond to TB. So we see some examples like that, but it, it, it does you know, require a much bigger level of mobilizations in terms of resources uh, to, to, uh, to support um, solidarity of responses. Uh, and it, it, the COVID does push us to be critical about the way that we do work, um, the funding uh, modalities that we provide to countries. Um, countries are now can apply for um, through a fast track mechanism if they are in need of uh, personal uh, protective equipment and oxygen. Uh, so they don't need to go through a range of processes that we put in place. Um, and also it asks us questions about how, how, how well uh, these health agencies are co collaborating among each other. Um, the big question about supply chains um, that we are uh, in talk with Gavi, uh, which is the lead agencies to really roll out vaccine in low and middle income countries, big questions with USAID and other development agencies on how to streamline the supply chain system. So those are quite um, rapidly moving conversations um, and it, it COVID, you know, as much as it does impact everything else, I think that's uh, probably a positive sign that it, it does ask us to appraise the way we work, the way that we monitor program, particularly agencies like the Global Fund does not have presence in country, right? Uh, so it's now looking at more regularly um, monitoring the impact of the um, COVID on the three diseases, working more collaboratively with institutes uh, and uh, universities to, to assess the impact um, of COVID-19 and human rights violations on, on, on programs and really looking at how to adapt the program to, to, to keep up to, this, to these needs. Um, and I think the most importantly for me personally, having observed in my position for uh, since last year, I think it, it does put to rest the the philosophical debates, right, around um, and false dichotomy around public health, in the public health space that we know whether donors should fund a disease specific program or the uh, health system strengthening. Um, it shows that we need to do both um, to ensure that there are better outcomes in the communities who are most um, affected. And it's a similar debate that we are uh, sometimes, you know, or we already have an answer for a long time about. Uh, how do you um, uh, improve public health response? And the question and the answer is really looking at the right based health system um, that should underpin any uh, response to health. Uh, so, unless the human rights of the communities uh, who are affected are respected and protected and fulfilled, uh, and health program probably uh, should include funding and be designed to really comprehensively address uh, human rights and gender related barriers to services for a uh, health program to be effective. Um, so I think that again, having 
COVID to really raise the question and making sure that we take lessons learned from the response to HIV, apply it to how we respond to emerging uh, disease threats. I think that's something that uh, multilateral agencies are learning from. And I think it's perhaps, it's, uh, in hindsight, it's probably a good thing that we, we, COVID does represent uh, that, that uh, opportunity for us. Thanks, Ed. I think that's an interesting point to really think about a little bit more. The, the position of health and human rights within donor funding generally has always been a little bit um, variable. I mean, sometimes there'd be a kind of movement towards more technocratic, scientific kind of approaches, and sometimes there'd be a recognition of the sort of fundamental need to support civil society and to have rights-based approaches. And I think COVID in some ways, in my view, I guess I, I haven't yet decided how this is gonna play out. On the one hand, you have this incredible technological success of a vaccine. And on the other hand, you have this incredible failure of equitable distribution of that technological success. So it does illustrate the need to sort of have both of these things, but I'm not sure if, if that conclusion will lead to a fundamental change in how global health is approached. And I'd be curious if, if any of you have a optimism or a pessimism of sort of what, what uh, global health donors are going to do kind of from the lessons learned that come out of this response. I, um, Joe, oh, there's, there's, there's so much bouncing through my mind at the moment that I want to comment on. Um, and and I, I think one of the things that I want to speak about is, is uh, the, the whole concept of fatigue um, and and so within HIV we have seen fatigue as soon as as um, as HIV became less visible in in uh, in uh, the US in Europe and in the UK then, we moved to a position that there was fatigue about dealing with it. And even though there has been success in expanding treatment around the, world, the, the, the globe, we have not met the targets that we have set for ourselves. And, and, uh, and my fear is that, that the progress that we have made in terms of, of responding to HIV is going to be eroded by the fact that our current health focus is COVID. And so now we're going to focus on COVID. And then we're going to get to that point where countries in, in the North have vaccinated everybody who wants to get vaccinated. And we've dealt with that very nicely. Thank you very much. And then that's done. And we don't have to worry about other people and we can just move on. And and we we leave these things hanging in the air because we haven't dealt with the fundamental in uh, uh, imbalances and uh, inequities to start with. So so um, for me, I have long uh, advocated that we need to have from within the faith community a, a, a consolidated. Um, um, voice that can be used in terms of advocating around these things. I've spoken about them in, as, at some time as faith ambassadors who can work with the UN system and try and, and do these things together so that we can identify what are some of the, the gross violations of, of human rights, frankly, because I think it is a gross violation of human rights that we, that we focus resources in one part of the world and we don't allow those to to reach the whole of humanity that's a problem so so i i think that that we need to be able to establish uh more broad-based partnerships that can find um the voices that that can be heard in various places together um that might seem very woolly <laughs> But I, I do think that it, 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 it is something that holds potential. Felicita, do you have a solution yeah. for us? 
No, I don't. But I just <laughs> wanted to <laughs> kind of echo what you both said. I think um, one of the things that is very clear in, in, in our part of the world is that this kind of siloed approach to our health interventions is not working. And COVID actually did expose that as well, because the emergency responses to COVID drastically reduced access to other types of um, non-COVID related services. So for example, there was a huge crisis around access to condoms during um, the, the, the lockdowns. There was a huge crisis around access to HIV testing because people would turn up at the hospital and be told, no, 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 sorry, we're doing nothing else but COVID testing. We're dealing with COVID right now. We're not dealing with your family planning needs. We're not dealing with um, you know, your, your other needs, um, including your HIV related needs. Right now we're dealing with COVID. Um, and the result of that is that we have, even in Namibia, we've recorded an unprecedentedly high number of unwanted pregnancies which I mean, in our mind is kind of a proxy indicator for where we can be with HIV infection rates, you know, six months later or a, or a year later. Um, and so there's kind of siloed thinking and saying, you know, we can only deal with this crisis right now. No, HIV is still an emergency. Um, and that for both these crises, the underlying issue is the, the social determinants of health, the inequities, the inequality, the marginalization, all of those kinds of issues. We just want to deal with kind of, this is how it's manifesting and we're dealing with that right now. We don't want to, and I think that's one of the, the hard lessons that, you know, will be repeated until we learn it is that, you know, we will keep on getting these kinds of crises because we're not dealing and we will not be resilient in how we deal with them because we're not dealing with the underlying issues and the determinants of, of health. Um, but what I wanted to also speak to, Joe, was something you mentioned about kind of funding and uh, how donors may respond. And um, as a, in my new position as director, funding is, is, is something that I think about often, <laughs> more often than I would like to. Um, and one of the biggest issues that we're actually facing and we're kind of projecting or preempting is that now that we have been able to find less resource intensive ways of doing things, um, because as organizations and civil society um, and, and communities, we've had to, you know, adapt to the fact that we can't um, convene kind of dialogues and meetings and bring people together. We're going to have to now find ways to do that uh, virtually. And the fact that this has had a huge impact on our expenditure. And so it is looking like we are able to do things in a cheaper manner. And the great worry that we're having is that, you know, a few years down the line, when things get back to more or less normal or whatever that might look like, that the expectation will be for already under-resourced civil society and community groups to be able to do more with even less. Um, and so that's really a big concern in terms of, you know, how donors may respond um, to, to what's emanating and what's, what's emerging from, from the COVID responses. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, they're welcome to put in questions to the Q&A. Um, we've had a couple so far, and we'll start um, reading them off as, as a, a few more come in. But, you know, it sort of seems to me like kind of par for the course that the response to a crisis is to say do more with less, right? And the question is, is that going to continue to be, you know, how, how you know, people are treated and sort of how do you push back and overcome and, and say, no, we actually need to do more with more. Um, so one question that kind of came in was about sort of how well human rights frameworks could deal with these issues of kind of transnational obligations. Um, you know, human rights frameworks are often targeted at the obligations of governments, um, but they don't necessarily take on um, issues of the obligations of one government to a government in another region. So. Does anyone want to take a stab at, at that uh, question? I can I can try to maybe start off, but maybe colleagues are in a much better position to, to respond to it. Like Felicita, you're in the front line. Before I respond to that, I just want to echo the last point that Felicita made around, you know, um, we have a challenge justifying to colleagues internally about the needs to continue to support civil society's work especially advocacy work, which you could only see most of the time results in a longer term horizon. Uh, so most of the resources redirected to the immediate health interventions. 
uh, leaving out a lot of questions about how, how do we ensure uh, work that we fund on advocacy, on human rights, on strategic litigations, uh, legal literacy program, know your right program continue, which is absolutely essential in this particular setting. Uh, and, and many times groups have to do advocacy to, you know, to change laws and to address policy impediments online. And my question is, how much can you really do online to really influence decision makers? I think that's we really raise big questions to us as to, you know, what is the better way to support community to, to be able to do that? So the, on that, I think I fully agree with, uh, with uh, Felicita and it's still a question that we, we are still thinking as the department within the Global Fund that, that supports community and human rights work. Uh, on the international human rights obligations, I think many of the instances, there are soft laws, right, that the, the government uh, signed onto, uh, which has limited leverage to really force certain countries to, to act on something. Uh, and, and, and this is a challenge we do have also reflecting on the global fund um, uh, infrastructures where um, the country ownership is promoted um, as a kind of principle that underwrites everything else. Uh, so there's always a kind of tension between what we can ask the governments to do uh, or, and what the government is willing to do and not willing to do. And again, it falls back on the issues around criminalization, so working to support um, communities who are affected that the governments are quite reluctant to do. And, and for me, I think this, this plays out again in this context of COVID, uh, whereby um, we ask the countries to again articulate who are the most vulnerable in their settings. And most of the time, these are you know, undocumented migrants where they do not have uh, basic access to social protection, for example, within the setting. Uh, and and, and we, we try to see how, how to encourage governments to develop a health response that are inclusive of those needs. Uh, so that's just to say, you know, we have to be looking at different ways to influence uh, donor governments and uh, governments in low-middle-income countries to come together and to look at um, some innovative partnerships that, that could really bring access to everybody. And that, that is pretty much a work in progress. Um, the big question for me is, you know, vaccine may be effective over the one-year horizon. What about next year? Would it be a ethical questions about who gets the new vac uh, repeated vaccines who don't? So I guess the debates are likely to continue even if people have been vaccinated. And, and I think we should really look into, as, as colleagues said, having this uh, as a long-term kind of dialogue where everyone's uh, engaged in dialogue and there should be support to really bring advocacy, bring urgency to this issue. So there's uh, more mobilizations around it uh, to make sure that it's on uh, um, at the forefront of the discussions around health and human rights. Thank you. Great. JP, did you want to jump in? Yes, uh, please, Joe. Um, my mother used to tell the story of, of the farmer who decided to to uh, teach his horse not to eat because it was a very effective way of of uh, farming more economically and so over a course of a number of of months he reduced and reduced and reduced the food and just when he managed to train his horse not to eat anymore the horse died and uh, you know this is the the, 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 the slow starvation that many uh, are within civil society are being subjected to at the moment. It's a slow starvation. Um, and and the, the concept that we can bring in voices in a virtual way, in a meaningful way around the world, is just cloud cuckoo land. I have sat in many meetings where we have people from the Global South who have been included in those meetings, and, and every time they start speaking, or half the time they speak, the, the sound breaks, or the image is not good, or, you know, and, and, but we've ticked the box, they've been there, it's been fine, you know, so we can do it, let's wear any again, uh, sorry, it, it, it's, it's not working. And, and uh, for us to, to really hear people, 
we have to be able to be with those people. So we have to find ways of facilitating that. And of course, one of the ways that we have to facilitate that is to make sure that everybody, for everybody, it's safe to travel and it's safe to be in spaces again together. Um, I, I think that that one of the things that that we will are, are going to have to focus on much more going forward is how we lay the foundation of social protections for everybody. Um, because those social protections are then going to be things that, that we can uh, globally agree on. The problem, of course, is that not everybody thinks that social protection is a good idea. Uh, some people think that as, uh, you know, we, we, we really don't have to provide these uh, for people without money. And, and um, why can't everybody buy their own? You know, well, if you don't have a job, you can't get a job you're an illegal immigrant, all of these sorts of things, it becomes a real problem. And, and when, we, when we continually create barriers for people in terms of all sorts of entry, you know, I think to myself about vaccines, how do you access a vaccine when you're in a country illegally, when you have to be recorded every, if, if you're going to get a vaccine? And as long as we have people who are in that situation, what does that mean in terms of the vulnerability of the whole population? I remember years ago in terms of HIV, uh, Botswana had this sweeping and wonderful system that they were going to provide antiretrovirals for everybody who was a Botswana citizen. And all the people who were, who were refugees who had come across from Zimbabwe um, didn't have access to antiretrovirals in Botswana. And Botswana had the system to say that if you have a child with a Botswana citizen, then you have a route to, to citizenship. I mean, it was just absolutely crazy because you were asking people not to get medication who were already living with HIV and to please go and have unprotected sex with our citizens so that we can give you a route to citizenship. So, you know, it, it's madness when we don't take the picture to, as a whole and i just want to say again maybe the theme for how we respond to covid 19 has to be along the lines of what archbishop Anche Iacolini is talking about a world of neighbors how do we support each other what is the social network that we offer each other thanks jp i think that's really profound and I think to me it resonates about this message of the knowledge and the value that we get from people from all parts of the world that you know in this instance you know vaccines may be coming from one country or another in the next instance the solution is going to come you know from the medicinal plants in a different country or from the knowledge that's brought uh, by a scientist from the global south, from here or there, and and so the, this idea of failing to recognize what the sum of all of our contributions are over a broader time period is what costs us money, it costs us lives, it costs us time, it costs us a, a just a spiritual sense of solidarity of living in the world as global citizens. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that's something just to, to try and get out of the specific crisis that we're in now and kind of keep our mind in as we have lots of rounds of lessons learned and lots of opportunities to apply those lessons in new contexts. We don't have a lot of time left, so I want to give everyone a chance to say one optimistic thing or hope that they have um, of you know how we we move from covid into a kind of post-covid world with respect for human rights felicity i'm going to go to you first and put you on the hot seat <laughs> thanks for that my optimism stems from the work that people like yourselves everybody that's on the panel you joe uh, nina others do um and and what COVID has taught me is also the resilience of 
the marginalized people that we work with, the communities that we work with, the civil society organizations, um, and people that are just deeply, deeply committed to addressing the, the challenges that their communities face. Um, and so that gives me hope. It gives me hope um, that also we're going into the next era um, with lots of innovation, you know, um, and, and that, that and a deep rooted commitment to human rights by, you know, a, gr a growing groundswell of people. And that, that's one of the things that, as, as everybody said now, you know, the COVID is teaching us. It is that, you know, human rights are key um, and addressing inequities is key and addressing, you know, social determinants is key. Otherwise, we're not going to have resilient communities. We're not going to have resilient countries and we're not going to have a resilient world. Um, so, yeah, I, I have a little bit of optimism because I have faith in, in people that, that truly, really believe in, in the role of human rights um, to respond to these issues. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Felicita. Ed? My optimism is very similar to Felicita. And, and I do think in, in my experience, I observe that the success of the health response really uh, are the one that um, really are driven by the community themselves and resilience of community really help to adapt and adjust the programs uh, to respond to any health uh, threats uh, in the way that it respect human rights for the communities. We see in so many settings, you know, groups are organizing, uh, moving the services online to reach their um, communities through virtual case management, online appointment system to decongest health facility. And this was previously very slow uptake, right? And, and, and the COVID does give that extra push for an organization to be able to innovate. Um, and at the same time, because these are the ideas that come from the community themselves, um, I'm less concerned, I'm more concerned about the programs that, for example, employing uh, online technology without having a safeguard in place to protect um, safety and confidentiality and privacy of clients. Uh, because something, you know, when the big program and resources come in and bring to scale, sometimes if the programs are not run by the community, they would not pay attention to it. And then we leave ourselves to, you know, um, vulnerability around, you know, human rights violations. I'm so very hopeful to see that um, in some settings, a program to address gender-based violence and intimate partner violence have received much more attention. And in most settings, like in South Africa, that is the only program that are allowed by the government to operate during the COVID restriction. So that means uh, the country started to recognize the value of funding uh, programs um, that really address the human rights related barriers, such as this one, or the one around the community empowerment or legal literacy, which is so important for people to know in this time of crisis, what rights do they have and how, how they can access them and how to document violations that they face as they try to access services. So in hindsight, you know, I hope that attention to these type of programs and investment in community roles continue um, and, and that um, government uh, stakeholders and donors started to really seriously investing in, uh, in this type of work to really support um, any response um, that would be required for the emerging um, diseases. Great. Thanks. Great. So JP? I want to talk about the blessings of COVID. I want to talk about the way that COVID has helped us understand our need for each other. How COVID has, has taught us that skin touch and contact with people is important. That we as human beings are social beings and our societies need to be healthy, not just individuals. I want to talk about the blessing of, of how COVID has laid bare the, the, the lie that profit is more important than people. It, it has been remarkable how we have seen just the, 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 the cruelty of chasing money rather than looking after people. I want to speak about the blessing of, of the sharing that has come through this. And, and you know, uh, uh, so many programs that have come about where neighbors 
do shopping for each other, where people reach out and find ways of creating the safe spaces for each other. All of those are lessons that we've learned because COVID has come and impacted on us in the way that it has. And I want to believe that these lessons might just be something that will stay with us for a while. And when, when I'm even older and greyer, we won't talk about, can you remember 2021? We'll say, do you remember the COVID time? Do you remember the lessons we learnt? We are a world of neighbours. A beautiful way to end. Thank you, JP, Felicita, Ed, for all of your insights, your sage words and counsels and perspectives, and the work that you're doing every day on COVID, on HIV and TB and global health generally. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone else for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, look forward to seeing you all virtually, in person, hugs in the future. So take care. Thanks. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks thank for you. having us.